Have you ever wondered why so many people stopped using Facebook? Have you ever wondered how exactly Amazon became the first website you think of when you want to buy something online? Have you ever wondered why so many content creators who had built massive followings on YouTube and Instagram suddenly rushed to TikTok back in 2020? Have you ever wondered why your experience on all of these platforms somehow gets worse and worse over time? Now you might say, too many old people started using Facebook so all the young people left. You might say that Amazon is just more convenient than any other online retailer. You might say that TikTok's algorithms are simply better and more effective than the ones on YouTube and Instagram. And you might say that your online experience gets worse because there are too many ads and too many creators making the same trash content. But is it really that simple? What if there was a predictable pattern that almost every online platform followed in the search for higher profits and market control? What if you could take a look behind the curtain and see how these online platforms systematically kill competition and creativity while forcing buyers and sellers, creators and consumers to participate in their little game of monopoly? Well, in this episode, I'm going to read a brilliant article written by the author and journalist Corey Doctorow about the predictable ways that every online platform we know of eventually turns to shit. From Amazon to Google, from Facebook to TikTok, it happens again and again and again. But before we get started, I should let you know that this is a pretty lengthy article with lots of advanced language. So instead of stopping to explain every noun, verb, and adjective, I'll be stopping periodically to simplify some of the more sophisticated language so that you can digest the message of this article more easily. Now, if you do want to understand all the advanced words and phrases used in this article, then make sure you download the PDF vocabulary guide because I've put all the definitions and explanations there. Now, you know I'm not one to waste time, my friend. So let's get right into it. Now, the title of this article is TikTok's in shittification. Now, you should know that the term in shittification is not a widely used or recognized term. I believe that Cory Doctorow invented this term to describe something that turns to shit. So when he says TikTok's in shittification, he's basically saying this is how TikTok went from an amazing app to a pile of shit. All right. All right, cool, my friend. Let's get right into it. And actually, before I start reading, I'll just let you know, you might be hearing motorcycles and car horns and all that shit just because, you know, this building is so close to the street and it's like literally all day, every fucking day, car horns and motors. So, you know, one of those things that can't be helped. So I apologize for the entire city. <laughs> I apologize on behalf of the city. All right, let's get into it. Here is how platforms die. First, they are good to their users. Then, they abuse their users to make things better for their business customers. Finally, they abuse those business customers to claw back all the value for themselves. And then, they die. I call this in shittification. And it's a seemingly inevitable consequence arising from the combination of the ease of changing how platforms allocate value combined with the nature of a two-sided market, where a platform sits between buyers and sellers, holding each hostage to each other, raking off an ever larger share of the value that passes between them. So let me stop and restate that in plain English. This is how platforms die. Platforms start by being nice to their users. Later, they treat their users poorly to benefit their business partners. Then they treat those business partners badly to take more benefits for themselves. And finally, they fail. This pattern happens because platforms can easily decide how to share benefits. They stand between buyers and sellers and take more and more from the money or value that's exchanged between them. All right, let's continue. When a platform starts, it needs users. So it makes itself valuable to users. Think of Amazon. For many years, it operated at a loss, using its access to capital markets to subsidize everything you bought. It sold goods below cost and shipped them below cost. It operated a clean and useful search. 
If you search for a product, Amazon tried its damnedest to put it at the top of the search results. This was a hell of a good deal for Amazon's customers. Lots of us piled in, and lots of brick and mortar retailers withered and died, making it hard to go elsewhere. Amazon sold us ebooks and audiobooks that were permanently locked to its platform with DRM, or Digital Rights Management, so that every dollar we spent on media was a dollar we'd have to give up if we deleted Amazon and its apps. And Amazon sold us Prime, getting us to prepay for a year's worth of shipping. Prime customers start their shopping on Amazon, and 90% of the time, they don't search anywhere else. That tempted in lots of business customers. Marketplace sellers who turned Amazon into the everything store it had promised from the beginning. As these sellers piled in, Amazon shifted to subsidizing suppliers. Kindle and Audible creators got generous packages. Marketplace sellers reached huge audiences and Amazon took low commissions from them. This strategy meant that it became progressively harder for shoppers to find things anywhere except Amazon, which meant that they only searched on Amazon, which meant that sellers had to sell on Amazon. That's when Amazon started to harvest the surplus from its business customers and send it to Amazon's shareholders. Today, marketplace sellers are handing 45% or more of the sale price to Amazon in junk fees. The company's $31 billion advertising program is really a payola scheme that pits sellers against each other, forcing them to bid on the chance to be at the top of your search. Searching Amazon doesn't produce the list of the products that most closely match your search. It brings up a list of products whose sellers have paid the most to be at the top of that search. Those fees are built into the cost you pay for the product, and Amazon's most favored nation requirement means that sellers cannot sell more cheaply elsewhere. So Amazon has driven prices at every retailer. Search Amazon for cat beds, and the entire first screen is ads, including ads for products Amazon cloned from its own sellers, putting them out of business. Because third parties have to pay 45% in junk fees to Amazon, but Amazon doesn't charge itself these fees. All told, the first five screens of results for Catbed are 50% ads. This is in shittification. Surpluses are first directed to users. Then, once they're locked in, surpluses go to suppliers. Then, once they're locked in, the surplus is handed to shareholders and the platform becomes a useless pile of shit. From mobile app stores to Steam. From Facebook to Twitter. This is the enshittification life cycle. Now let me stop and restate that in plain English. When a platform starts, it tries to attract users by offering them good deals. For example, Amazon sold products at very low prices, even if it meant losing money. They also made searching easy. If you looked for an item, Amazon showed it to you right away. And this was great for Amazon's customers. Many people started buying from Amazon, and many regular stores struggled because of it. Amazon also sold books and other items that only worked on Amazon's devices. And they introduced a service called Prime, where people paid up front for faster shipping. Most Prime customers only shopped on Amazon and didn't check other places. Now, Because of this, many businesses wanted to sell their products on Amazon. And Amazon helped these sellers by charging them less money and promoting their items. But over time, it became hard for people to find products outside of Amazon. And this meant that businesses felt they had to sell on Amazon. And later, Amazon started charging these businesses more money. So now when you search for something on Amazon, the top results are often products from sellers who paid Amazon more money. And this means the price you pay is higher because of these fees. Also, when you search for something like cat beds on Amazon, many of the results are just ads. And this pattern is when platforms first benefit users, then benefit sellers, and finally benefit themselves at the expense of others. And this has happened with many platforms like app stores and social media sites. All right, let's continue. 
This is why, as Kat Valente wrote in her magisterial pre-Christmas essay, platforms like Prodigy transformed themselves overnight. From a place where you went for social connection to a place where you were expected to stop talking to each other and start buying things. This shell game with surpluses is what happened to Facebook. First, Facebook was good to you. It showed you the things the people you loved and cared about had to say. This created a kind of mutual hostage taking. Once a critical mass of people you cared about were on Facebook, it became effectively impossible to leave because you'd have to convince all of them to leave too and agree on where to go. You may love your friends, but half the time you can't agree on what movie to see and where to go for dinner. Forget it. Then it started to cram your feed full of posts from accounts you didn't follow. At first, it was media companies who Facebook preferentially crammed down its users' throats so that they would click on articles and send traffic to newspapers, magazines, and blogs. Then, once those publications were dependent on Facebook for their traffic, it dialed down their traffic. First, it choked off traffic to publications that used Facebook to run excerpts with links to their own sites as a way of driving publications into supplying full text feeds inside Facebook's walled garden. This made publications truly dependent on Facebook. Their readers no longer visited the publication's websites, they just tuned in to them on Facebook. The publications were hostage to those readers, who were hostage to each other. Facebook stopped showing readers the articles publications ran, tuning the algorithm to suppress posts from publications unless they paid to boost their articles to the readers who had explicitly subscribed to them and asked Facebook to put them in their feeds. Now, Facebook started to cram more ads into the feed, mixing payola from people you wanted to hear from with payola from strangers who wanted to commandeer your eyeballs. It gave those advertisers a great deal, charging a pittance to target their ads based on the dossiers of non-consensually harvested personal data they had stolen from you. Sellers became dependent on Facebook too, unable to carry on business without access to those targeted pitches. That was Facebook's cue to jack up ad prices, stop worrying so much about ad fraud, and collude with Google to rig the ad market through an illegal program called Jedi Blue. All right, let me stop and restate all that in plain English. Kat Valente once wrote about how platforms like Prodigy changed quickly. They went from being places for people to talk to each other to places where people were encouraged to buy things. A similar thing happened on Facebook. At first, Facebook was great for users. It let you see posts from your friends and family. This made it hard to leave Facebook because all your friends were there. It's hard to get everyone to agree on a new place to go when sometimes you can't even agree on simple things like where to eat. And then, Facebook began showing you posts from accounts you didn't follow. And at first, these were media companies. Facebook wanted users to click on articles and visit other websites. But after these media companies relied on Facebook for their audience, Facebook reduced the number of people who saw their posts. They wanted these companies to put their full articles on Facebook instead of just a link. And this meant that people read articles directly on Facebook and didn't visit the original websites. And because of this, the media companies were stuck with Facebook. Facebook then decided to show fewer articles to users unless the companies paid. They also started showing more ads. Advertisers liked Facebook because they could show their ads to specific people. Facebook had a lot of information about its users, but after some time, Facebook began charging these advertisers more money. They even worked with Google on a program called Jedi Blue, which wasn't fair to everyone in the advertising world. All right, let's continue. Today, Facebook is terminally in -shittified. A terrible place to be whether you're a user, a media company, or an advertiser. It's a company that deliberately demolished a huge fraction of the publishers it relied on, defrauding them into a pivot to video based on false claims of the popularity of video among Facebook users. Companies threw billions into the pivot, but the viewers never materialized, and media outlets folded in droves. But Facebook has a new pitch. It claims to be called Meta, and it has demanded that we live out the rest of our days as legless, sexless, heavily surveilled, low-poly cartoon characters. 
It has promised companies that make apps for this metaverse that it won't rug them the way it did the publishers on the old Facebook. It remains to be seen whether they'll get any takers. As Mark Zuckerberg once candidly confessed to appear, marveling at all of his fellow Harvard students who sent their personal information to his new website, the Facebook, I don't know why. They trust me. Dumb fucks. <laughs> all right, let me stop and restate all of that in plain English. Today, many people don't like using Facebook, whether they're regular users, media companies, or advertisers. Facebook once misled many companies by saying that videos were very popular on its platform. So these companies invested a lot of money to make videos, but not many people watched them. And because of this, many media companies faced serious problems. And now, Facebook wants to change its image and call itself Meta. They want us to use a new online world where we look like simple cartoon characters. They promise that they won't trick the companies making apps for this new world like they did before. But it's unclear if companies will trust them. In the past, Mark Zuckerberg, the founder of Facebook, once said he was surprised that people trusted his website with their personal information and even went as far as calling them dumb fucks. <laughs> you dumb fucks. All right, let's continue. Once you understand the inshittification pattern, a lot of the platform mysteries solve themselves. Think of the SEO market or the whole energetic world of online creators who spend endless hours engaged in useless platform Kremlinology, hoping to locate the algorithmic tripwires, which, if crossed, doom the creative works they pour their money, time, and energy into. Working for the platform can be like working for a boss who takes money out of every paycheck for all the rules you broke, but who won't tell you what those rules are because if he told you that, then you'd figure out how to break those rules without him noticing and docking your pay. Content moderation is the only domain where security through obscurity is considered a best practice. The situation is so dire that organizations like Tracking Exposed have enlisted a human army of volunteers and a robot army of headless browsers to try to unwind the logic behind the arbitrary machine judgments of the algorithm, both to give users the option to tune the recommendations they receive and to help creators avoid the wage theft that comes from being shadow banned. So let me stop and restate that in plain English. Once you see a pattern of platforms becoming less user-friendly, many things become clear. Consider the world of online creators. They spend a lot of time trying to understand how platforms work. They hope to find out the hidden rules of these platforms. And if they break these rules, their content might not be seen by many people. It's like having a boss who takes away some of your pay for breaking rules, but doesn't tell you what the rules are. And this is because if you knew the rules, you might find ways around them. And now, the situation is so challenging that some groups are trying to figure out how these platforms decide what to show users. They use both volunteers and computer programs to do this. They hope to help users see more of what they want and also help creators understand the rules better. And this way, creators won't miss out on potential earnings or potential money. All right, let's continue. But what if there is no underlying logic? Or more to the point, what if the logic shifts based on the platform's priorities? If you go down to the midway at your county fair, you'll spot some poor sucker walking around all day with a giant teddy bear that they won by throwing three balls in a peach basket. The peach basket is a rigged game. The carny can use a hidden switch to force the balls to bounce out of the basket. No one wins a giant teddy bear unless the carny wants them to win it. Now, why did the carny let the sucker win the giant teddy bear? So that he'd carry it around all day, convincing other suckers to put down five bucks for their chance to win one. The carny allocated a giant teddy bear to that poor sucker the way platforms allocate surpluses to key performers, as a convincer in a big store con a way to rope in other suckers who will make content for the platform, anchoring themselves and their audiences to it. Which brings me to TikTok. TikTok is many different things, including a free Adobe Premiere for teenagers that live on their phones. But what made it such a success early on was the power of its recommendation system. From the start, TikTok was really 
really good at recommending things to his users. Eerily good. By making good faith recommendations of things it thought users would like, TikTok built a mass audience, larger than many thought possible given the death grip of its competitors like YouTube and Instagram. Now that TikTok has the audience, it's consolidating its gains and seeking to lure away the media companies and creators who are still stubbornly attached to YouTube and Insta. So let me stop and restate that in plain English. Imagine going to the county fair and seeing someone with a big teddy bear they won in a game. You know those games, maybe you've seen them in videos or in movies. You go to a fair and they have these challenges where you pay $5, you get three balls, and you have to throw all three balls into a basket. And if you can do that, then you win a prize. Because the game seems really easy, but the fact is it's rigged. The person that's running that game is controlling whether or not the people actually win. You see what I'm saying? So it looks easy because they want you to believe it's easy. You spend your money, you play the game, you're going to fucking lose unless they want you to win, but you try anyway. So the person running the game will let somebody win so that other people will see the giant prize and they will want to play too with the hopes of winning the game. It's just a trick to get more people to spend more money on that game. And platforms on the internet work in a very similar way. They might show some people's content more to attract others to use the platform. I'll take TikTok as an example. It became popular because it was really good at showing users videos they would like. Tons of people were going viral on TikTok, right? Now this made many people use TikTok. Now, now that they have a lot of users, they're trying to get more content creators to move from other platforms like YouTube and Instagram over to TikTok. I really hope that makes sense. It's a key part of this entire article, okay? So let's continue. Yesterday, Forbes' Emily Baker White broke a fantastic story about how that actually works inside of ByteDance. TikTok's parent company, citing multiple internal sources, revealing the existence of a heating tool that TikTok employees use to push videos from select accounts into millions of viewers' feeds. These videos go into TikTok users' For You feeds, which TikTok misleadingly describes as being populated by videos ranked by an algorithm that predicts your interests based on your behavior in the app. In reality, for You is only sometimes composed of the videos that TikTok thinks will add value to your experience. The rest of the time, it's full of videos that TikTok has inserted in order to make creators think that TikTok is a great place to reach an audience. Sources told Forbes that TikTok has often used heating to court influencers and brands, enticing them into partnerships by inflating their videos' view count. This suggests that heating has potentially benefited some influencers and brands, those with whom TikTok has sought business relationships, at the expense of others whom it has not. In other words, TikTok is handing out giant teddy bears. So let me stop and restate that in plain English. Recently, a story from Forbes by Emily Baker White talked about how TikTok, a popular video app, promotes some videos. Inside TikTok's parent company, ByteDance, they have a tool called the Heating Tool. And this tool helps TikTok push certain videos to many users. Now, usually, TikTok tells users that videos in their For You feed are chosen by a system that knows what they like. But that's not always true. Sometimes, TikTok puts videos there to make content creators feel that TikTok is the best place for them. Forbes said that TikTok has used this tool to attract famous people and companies. They make their videos popular to get them to work with TikTok. And this means some people get special treatment while others do not. It's like TikTok is giving out big prizes to get more people to play their game. You see? All right, let's continue. But TikTok is not in the business of giving away giant teddy bears. TikTok for all that its origins are in the quasi-capitalist Chinese economy, is just another paperclip maximizing artificial colony organism that treats human beings as inconvenient gut flora. TikTok is only going to funnel free attention to the people it wants to entrap until they are entrapped. Then it will withdraw that attention and begin to monetize it. Monetize is a terrible word that tactically admits that there is no such thing as an 
attention economy. You can't use attention as a medium of exchange. You can't use it as a store of value. You can't use it as a unit of account. Attention is like cryptocurrency, a worthless token that is only valuable to the extent that you can trick or coerce someone into parting with fiat currency in exchange for it. You have to monetize it. That is, you have to exchange the fake money for real money. In the case of cryptos, the main monetization strategy was deception-based. Exchanges and projects handed out a bunch of giant teddy bears, creating an army of true believer Judas goats who convinced their peers to hand the carny their money and try to get some balls into the peach basket themselves. But deception only produces so much liquidity provision. Eventually, you run out of suckers. To get lots of people to try the ball toss, you need coercion, not persuasion. Think of how U.S. companies ended the defined benefits pension that guaranteed you a dignified retirement, replacing it with the market-based 401k pensions that forced you to gamble your savings in a rigged casino, making you the sucker at the table, ripe for the picking. Early crypto liquidity came from ransomware. The existence of a pool of desperate, panicked companies and individuals whose data had been stolen by criminals created a baseline of crypto liquidity because they could only get their data back by trading real money for fake crypto money. The next phase of crypto coercion was Web3, converting the web into a series of toll booths that you could only pass through by trading real money for fake crypto money. The internet is a must-have, not a nice-to-have, a prerequisite for full participation in employment, education, family life, health, politics, civics, even romance. By holding all those things to ransom behind crypto toll booths, the hodlers hoped to convert their tokens to real money. Now, I'm sure most of that didn't make sense because I didn't even get all of that the first time I read it, so let me restate all of that in plain English. TikTok doesn't just give out benefits without a reason. It might give special attention to some people to make them stay on the platform, but once they're fully involved, TikTok might take away that special attention and find ways to make money from it. The word monetize means turning something into money. It admits that just getting attention isn't the same as making money. Attention, like a type of digital money called cryptocurrency, isn't valuable on its own. It's only valuable when you can get someone to give you real money for it. With cryptocurrency, at first, many people believed in its value and tried to get others to join. But after a while, you can't just convince people. You might need to force them in some way. A real-life example is how some companies in the U.S. changed their retirement plans. Instead of promising a set amount, they made employees invest their money, which is much riskier. For cryptocurrency, at first, people had to use it to pay ransoms for their stolen data. And then, the next step was trying to make the internet a place where you have to pay with cryptocurrency to access certain things. Since the internet is so important in our lives, this could force more people to use cryptocurrency and give real money in exchange for it. Now, I, I hope that makes sense, but just, just know if you didn't understand all of that, it's not key to understanding the overall article. It's just an example using cryptocurrency, which is hard for many of us to understand. So don't worry too much about that and just keep focusing on the in of TikTok. All right, let's continue. For TikTok, handing out free teddy bears by heating the videos posted by skeptical performers and media companies is a way to convert them to true believers getting them to push all their chips into the middle of the table, abandoning their efforts to build audiences on other platforms. Once those performers and media companies are hooked, the next phase will begin. TikTok will withdraw the heating that sticks their videos in front of people who never heard of them and haven't asked to see their videos. TikTok is performing a delicate dance here. There's only so much in shitification they can visit upon their users' feeds, and TikTok has lots of other performers they want to give giant teddy bears to. TikTok won't just starve performers of the free attention by de-preferencing them in the algorithm. It will actively punish them by failing to deliver their videos to the users who subscribe to them. After all, every time TikTok shows you a video you asked to see, 
it loses a chance to show you a video it wants you to see. Because your attention is a giant teddy bear it can give away to a performer it is wooing. This is just what Twitter has done as part of its march to enshittification. Thanks to its monetization changes, the majority of people who follow you will never see the things you post. I have 500,000 followers on Twitter and my threads used to routinely get hundreds of thousands or even millions of reads. Today, it's hundreds, perhaps thousands. I just handed Twitter $8 for Twitter Blue because the company has strongly implied that it will only show the things I post to the people who ask to see them if I pay ransom money. This is the latest battle in one of the internet's longest simmering wars. The fight over end to end. So let me restate that in plain English. TikTok gives special attention to some videos to make the people who posted them believe in the platform. This can convince them to focus more on TikTok and less on other platforms. This special attention might also make it difficult for them to use their videos on other platforms. But once these people depend on TikTok, the platform might reduce that special attention. TikTok has to be careful because they can't make the user experience bad by showing too many unwanted videos, and they also want to attract new people to their platform. In the future, TikTok might not only reduce the special attention, but might also not show videos to people who want to see them. This is because TikTok wants to control what videos people see. And Twitter has done something similar. Even if you have many followers, not all of them will see what you post. For example, I have around 500,000 followers on Twitter. Now before, many of them saw my posts, but now only a few of them do. I even paid Twitter to hopefully have more people see my posts. And this is a big problem on the internet. It's about who gets to decide what content is shown to users. All right, let's continue. In the beginning, there were bellheads and netheads. The bellheads worked for big telcos or telecommunication companies, and they believed that all the value of the network rightly belonged to the carrier. If someone invented a new feature, for example, caller ID, it should only be rolled out in a way that allows the carrier to charge you every month for its use. This is software as a service, Ma Bell style. The netheads, by contrast, believe that the value should move to the edges of the network, spread out, pluralized. In theory, CompuServe could have monetized its own version of caller ID by making you pay $2.99 extra to see the from line on email before you open the message, charging you to know who was speaking before you started listening. But they didn't. The netheads wanted to build diverse networks with lots of users, lots of competition, and easy, low-cost switching between competitors. Some wanted this because they believed that the net would someday be woven into the world, and they didn't want to live in a world of rent-seeking landlords. Others were true believers in market competition as a source of innovation. Some believed both things. Either way, they saw the risk of network capture, the drive to monetization through trickery and coercion, and they wanted to head it off. They conceived of the end-to-end -end principle, the idea that networks should be designed so that willing speakers' messages would be delivered to willing listeners' endpoints as quickly and reliably as they could be. That is, irrespective of whether a network operator could make money by sending you the data it wanted to receive, its duty would be to provide you with the data you wanted to see. The end-to-end -end principle is dead at the service level today. Useful idiots on the right were tricked into thinking that the risk of Twitter mismanagement was woke shadow banning, whereby the things you said wouldn't reach the people who asked to hear them because Twitter's deep state didn't like your opinions. The real risk, of course, is that the things you say won't reach the people who asked to hear them because Twitter can make more money by inshittifying their feeds and charging you ransom for the privilege to be included in them. So let me stop and restate that in plain English. Long ago, there were two groups of people, bellheads and netheads. The bellheads worked for big telephone companies and believed the company should control and earn from every feature of the network. 
For example, if there was a new feature like seeing who's calling or caller ID, the company should charge customers extra for it. The NetHeads had a different idea. They believed that the power and value of the network should be shared with everyone using it. They didn't want companies to charge extra for basic things. For instance, an email service could charge you extra to see who sent an email, but they didn't. The NetHeads wanted a network where people had many choices and could easily switch between services. They believed in competition and didn't want one big company controlling everything. They came up with a principle that networks should deliver messages from one person to another without interference, no matter if the company could profit from it or not. But today, this principle is not followed very much. Some people thought the main problem was companies hiding certain messages because they didn't agree with them. But the real issue is that companies control what you see to make more money. They might even charge you extra to make sure your message is actually seen by other people. All right, let's continue. As I said at the start of this essay, Inshittification exerts a nearly irresistible gravity on platform capitalism. It's just too easy to turn the inshittification dial up to 11. Twitter was able to fire the majority of its skilled staff and still crank the dial all the way over, even with a skeleton crew of desperate, demoralized H-1B workers who were shackled to Twitter's sinking ship by threat of deportation. The temptation to inshittify is magnified by the blocks of interoperability. When Twitter bans interoperable clients, nerfs its APIs, and periodically terrorizes its users by suspending them for including their Mastodon handles in their bios, it makes it harder to leave Twitter, and thus increases the amount of inshittification users can be force-fed without risking their departure. Twitter is not going to be a protocol. I'll bet you a testicle that projects like Blue Sky will find no meaningful purchase on the platform. Because if Blue Sky were implemented and Twitter users could order their feeds for minimal inshittification and leave the service without sacrificing their social networks, it would kill the majority of Twitter's monetization strategies. An inshittification strategy only succeeds if it is pursued in measured amounts. Even the most locked-in user eventually reaches a breaking point and walks away, or gets pushed. The villagers of Anet I can't even say that. The villagers of Anatevka in Fiddler on the roof tolerated the Cossacks' violent raids and pogroms for years, until they were finally forced to flee to Krakow, New York, and Chicago. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't know what the fuck he's talking about. For inshittification adult companies, that balance is hard to strike. Individual product managers, executives, and activist shareholders all give preference to quick returns at the cost of sustainability and are in a race to see who can eat their seed corn first. Inshittification has only lasted for as long as it has because the internet has devolved into five giant websites, each filled with screenshots of the other four. So let me do my best to restate that in plain English. At the beginning of this article, I mentioned how platforms often end up becoming worse over time, a process I called inshittification. It's very tempting for companies to let this happen because it's an easy way to make more money. For example, Twitter was able to make their platform worse even when they had fewer skilled workers. This problem becomes bigger when platforms don't let their users easily switch to or use other services. For instance, Twitter makes it difficult for users to connect with other platforms. This makes users feel trapped, so the company can make the platform even worse without worrying about users leaving. Some people hope Twitter might change and become more open, but I doubt it. If Twitter let users easily customize and control their experience, it might hurt the company's money-making methods. But companies need to be careful. If they make their platforms too bad, even loyal users will leave. Imagine a village where people tolerate bad things for a while, but then it becomes too much and they decide to move somewhere else. For companies that are used to making things worse to earn more, finding the right balance can be difficult. They focus on quick profits rather than long-term success. And this problem continues because most of the internet is controlled by a few big platforms. 
And that last thing he said, Enchidification has only lasted for as long as it has because the internet has devolved into five giant websites, each filled with screenshots of the other four. What he's referring to is the fact that sometimes you'll go on Instagram and you'll just see screenshots from TikTok or Twitter or YouTube and vice versa. So it's like these five main platforms and people use one as their main platform, but they're still taking content from the others and just posting it on their preferred platform. So all the same shit is just circulating amongst all the main platforms. I hope that makes sense. All right, let's continue. With the market sewn up by a group of cozy monopolists, better alternatives don't pop up and lure us away. And if they do, the monopolists just buy them out and integrate them into their in shitification strategies. Like when Mark Zuckerberg noticed a mass exodus of Facebook users who were switching to Instagram. And so he bought Instagram. As Zuckerberg says, it's better to buy than to compete. This is the hidden dynamic behind the rise and fall of Amazon Smile, the program whereby Amazon gave a small amount of money to charities of your choice when you shopped there, but only if you used Amazon's own search tool to locate the products you purchased. This provided an incentive for Amazon customers to use its own increasingly in search, which it could cram full of products from sellers who coughed up payola as well as its own lookalike products. The alternative was to use Google, whose search tool would send you directly to the product you were looking for and then charge Amazon a commission for sending you to it. The demise of Amazon's smile coincides with the increasing in of Google search, the only successful product the company managed to build in-house. All of its other successes were bought from other companies. Video, docs, cloud, ads, mobile, while its own products are either flops like Google Video, clones like Gmail, which is just a copy of Hotmail, or adapted from other companies' products like Chrome. So let me stop and restate that in plain English. The big companies in the market work closely together, and this stops new and better options from appearing. If a new company does start to become popular, the big companies just buy them. For example, when many Facebook users started using Instagram, Mark Zuckerberg just bought Instagram. He believed it's easier to buy a company than compete with it. Amazon had a program called Amazon Smile. When customers bought items, Amazon would give a little money to a charity the customer chose. But there was a catch. Customers had to use Amazon's search tool, which began to show products that paid Amazon more money or were similar to Amazon's own products. On the other hand, if customers used Google to search, they would find products easily, but Amazon would have to pay Google. However, Amazon's smile went away around the same time Google's search became worse. Google's own original products usually didn't do well. They either bought successful products from other companies or copied them. For instance, they bought YouTube and Google Docs, but their own video service failed. And Gmail was similar to an earlier service called Hotmail. All right, let's continue. Google Search was based on principles set out in founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin's landmark 1998 paper, Anatomy of a Large-Scale Hypertextual Web Search Engine, in which they wrote, Advertising-funded search engines will be inherently biased towards the advertisers and away from the needs of the customers. Even with that foundational understanding of inshitification, Google has been unable to resist its siren song. Today's Google results are an increasingly useless morass of self-preferencing links to its own products, ads for products that aren't good enough to float to the top of the list on its own, and parasitic SEO junk piggybacking on the former. Inshitification kills. Google just laid off 12,000 employees and the company is in a full-blown panic over the rise of AI chatbots and is making a full court press for an AI-driven search tool. That is, a tool that won't show you what you ask for, but rather what it thinks you should see. Now it's possible to imagine that such a tool will produce good recommendations, like TikTok's pre inshitified algorithm did. But it's hard to see how Google will be able to design a non-inshitified chatbot front-end to search, 
given the strong incentives for product managers, executives, and shareholders to inshitify results to the precise threshold at which users are nearly pissed off enough to leave, but not quite. Even if it manages the trick, this almost but not quite unusable equilibrium is fragile. Any exogenous shock, a new competitor like TikTok that penetrates the anti-competitive moats and walls of big tech, a privacy scandal, a worker uprising, can send it into wild oscillations. So let me stop and restate that in plain English because, like I said from the beginning, this article is not written in a way that people actually speak. All right, here we go. Google Search was created based on ideas from a 1998 paper written by its founders, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. In this paper, they warned that search engines funded by ads would favor advertisers over users. But today, Google often shows results that favor its own products or ads for products that aren't the best. They also show links that try to take advantage of Google's system. Google is now facing problems. They recently let go of 12,000 workers and are worried about the rise of new AI chat systems. They're trying to make their own AI search tool. And this tool might not show you exactly what you're looking for, but what it thinks you should see. Now it's possible to imagine this new tool could be good, like how TikTok was in the beginning, but it's hard to believe that Google will keep it that way. There's pressure from different people in the company to make the most money, even if it's at the expense of the user experience. Now, if Google pushes too much, users might get frustrated and leave. And if something unexpected happens, like a new competitor or a big company issue, it can make things even more unstable. All right, let's continue. Inshitification truly is how platforms die. And that's fine, actually. We don't need eternal rulers of the internet. It's okay for new ideas and new ways of working to emerge. The emphasis of lawmakers and policymakers shouldn't be preserving the crepuscular senescence of dying platforms. Rather, our policy should focus on minimizing the cost to users when these firms reach their expiry date. Enshrining rights like end-to-end -end would mean that no matter how auto-cannibalistic a zombie platform became, willing speakers and willing listeners would still connect with each other. And policymakers should focus on freedom of exit. The right to leave a sinking platform while continuing to stay connected to the communities that you left behind, enjoying the media and apps you bought, and preserving the data you created. The netheads were right. Technological self-determination is at odds with the natural imperatives of tech businesses. They make more money when they take away our freedom. Our freedom to speak, to leave, to connect. For many years, even TikTok's critics grudgingly admitted that no matter how surveillant and creepy it was, it was really good at guessing what you wanted to see. But TikTok couldn't resist the temptation to show you the things it wants you to see rather than what you want to see. The inshitification has begun, and now it's unlikely to stop. It's too late to save TikTok. Now that it's been infected by inshitification, the only thing left is to kill it with fire. Now let me stop and restate all of that in plain English. Platforms can fail when they become bad for users. And that's okay because we don't need the same websites to be popular forever. New and better ideas can come up. And lawmakers shouldn't just try to save old platforms. Instead, they should make sure users don't suffer when these platforms end. For example, even if a platform is not doing well, people should still be able to communicate with each other. Also, people should have the right to leave a platform and still keep their friends and the things they bought, and their own data. The main idea is technology should give us choices and freedom. Big tech companies often take away our freedom because they make more money that way. They decide what we see and what we do. Now, for a long time, even people who didn't like TikTok said it was really good at showing things we wanted to see. But now, TikTok is showing us what it wants, not what we want. And this is the start of its decline. TikTok is on a bad path, and the only thing left to do is let it die.
All right, my friends. I know that was a very lengthy article. I warned you from the beginning. I warned you, but uh, you stuck with it. You know, you stuck with me till the end. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope it made sense. And like I said, you can read the vocabulary guide. You can read the whole article. You can read the summaries in plain English, see the vocabulary, the explanations, all that good stuff, because it really is an interesting topic. It's just a very long article with with a form of language that doesn't sound natural like nobody really talks that way so don't feel bad if it was really challenging to understand because i had to read it like twice to really I, sh I shouldn't say it that way the first time i read it i was constantly stopping to be like what what because sometimes when you write a sentence a particular way it just makes it harder to understand what you're trying to say which is normal when you're reading articles or blog posts or even some books, because for whatever reason, writers feel that they need to write in a way that's, I don't know, sophisticated or smart, or they need to use a bunch of more specific vocabulary to get their point across. But for a lot of people, that just makes it harder to understand the message. So don't feel bad if it was hard for you to understand the message. All right. And I mean, this, how long, how are we doing on time? I mean, this episode is already pretty long. I was thinking about giving my thoughts on all of this, but Jesus Christ, man, it would take me another hour to get through all that shit. So I'll just end this by saying that um, I think this is just uh, what I talk about from time to time. The problem with all these platforms being free, because for these platforms to sustain themselves, the money has to come from somewhere. And the sad truth is that most people are not willing to pay for the content that they consume on these platforms because we've all just been slowly trained to think everything will be free and a lot of people don't consider they never ask themselves why is this shit free and even once we're told why it's free right they're they're stealing our data they're selling it, selling it to companies and blah 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 even once we know that we keep using the shit because it's free right it's so addictive it's like free drugs, literally. You know what I'm saying? Imagine if a crackhead just had an unlimited supply to free crack. That's basically all of us with our phones and these platforms, you know? But what that means is that the experience just gets worse and worse because the money has to come from somewhere. And if it's not coming from the users, it has to come from advertisers. And then once the advertisers are stuck on these platforms, the platform owners are like, well, I got the users and I got the advertisers and businesses. Fuck both of y'all. I'm going to take all the money for myself, you know, and it, I'm not just saying this because I'm a content creator. I also support my favorite content creators with monthly subscriptions. I'm not just saying that because I would like to have more subscribers to this podcast who are supporting my work. I'm not, that's not the reason I'm saying this. I'm saying this because eventually we're going to get to a point where it's impossible to find quality content and everybody's just consuming a digital form of fast food, a bunch of bullshit, you know? And it's funny how like we'll all complain that it's the same content again and again. It's a bunch of dumb shit. It's so hard to find something interesting. I'll spend 30 minutes just looking for an interesting video to watch and blah, blah. It's because people who want to put out good shit can't get paid for it. They don't have enough uh, followers or, or readers or listeners or whatever to get enough money from ad revenue. And all those listeners and followers and readers don't want to support them with a the monthly subscription. So how are they going to have the time to dedicate to something like this when they also have to make money, you know? So I'm not saying that because I want people to support me more. I'm saying that I, I believe in my heart the only way that we can counteract this in shitification is by supporting quality content creators who are putting out quality shit. I really believe that. There's no other way, dude. There's no other way. Because again, even if a new platform pops up, and people start putting good content on there. Eventually, the platform is going to have to make serious money. So it's going to run more ads, attract more businesses, fuck the people creating the content, and then eventually fuck the people advertising on that platform and keep all the money for itself. Again, it happens on every platform. Every single one. So I don't know, man. I don't know. I'm not saying that you should pay, you know, you should spend half your paycheck just to support all your favorite creators because maybe you follow 15 different people. You're not going to give all of them five or 10 or 20 bucks a month because then you're broke. I understand that. I'm just saying, man, <laughs> like, you know, until you start paying for good shit, you're probably not going to get good shit. I, t a dude sent me a message on Instagram the other day. He said, hey, Tony, is your Discord community free? Because I really need to practice my English. 
And immediately I'm just thinking to myself, like, okay, which imagine if you owned a restaurant and just people started coming in and saying, Hey, is the food that you serve here free? Because I'm really hungry. So what the fuck are you talking about? You know what I'm saying? It's just like it's sad that we, all of us, all of us, just expect everything to be free or dirt cheap, but we still want enormous value from the people giving it to us. It's it's retarded, bro. It's retarded. And it's it's kind of sad because another thing he touched on in the article is like what they'll do is hand out giant teddy bears. So again, with TikTok, when it first blew up during the pandemic, everybody was so excited to get on TikTok because it was so easy to go viral. You could reach millions of people every day, every week, every month, build your gigantic audience, be famous, get brand deals, make lots of money. So fuck YouTube, fuck Instagram, fuck Twitter, come to TikTok, right? That's what they did. But in reality, it's artificial. It's the same thing on YouTube. The same thing on YouTube. We see if you go down like the on the main page of YouTube, your home page, you see a, the small handful of the same creators who are getting most of the attention on the platform. And it makes you think, oh, if I just work really hard, if I'm just consistent and put out good stuff, I'll be like them one day. No, bro. No. They are the minority. They are the exception. Most people posting content online are not getting huge amounts of views or huge amounts of money they're just grinding away with their fingers crossed hoping that the algorithm will start to show their shit to the people who need to see it hoping that the people who see it will like it enough and care about it enough to support it so that they can continue producing that shit it's not sustainable i don't know man i don't know i don't have the answer i don't have the solution to this problem i really don't i just know the way things are currently, it's just not sustainable, bro. It's not sustainable. And the title of this episode is The Internet Sucks Now. And that's, I really feel that way. It fucking sucks, bro. It fucking sucks. Because it's like, you, even if you want to be a creator and put out good shit, how are you going to monetize without reaching a massive, massive, massive audience? And that's really why I'm taking a different approach. I, instead of trying to reach millions of people and have the biggest and best, most famous podcast, I just want to serve a small, high quality group of people who are motivated to learn and practice and make friends and join a community and be involved and be engaged and grow, not just as an English speaker, but as a person. You know, so anywhere from 100 to 1,000 people. And of course, you have to pay a higher subscription price than you would on something like Hello Talk or Tandem or any other any other service like that. But still, it's a it's a much higher quality experience. That's the approach I'm taking is a smaller, more focused community of people who are truly engaged as opposed to just trying to reach millions of people hoping I can get enough money from the ads. That's not sustainable. And it's also unlikely. It's also unlikely, you know, just based on how these platforms work. That's what this whole article is about. So I don't know, man. I'm very curious to know what you think. So whenever you get a chance, I know this was a long episode. You might want to listen to it more than once, or you might want to read the PDF vocabulary guide to see the explanations, the definitions, and really internalize this concept. But once you do, let me know your thoughts. Hit me up on Discord and give me your thoughts on the current state of the internet, the current state of the content that you're consuming, and maybe what you would like to see more of, right? What's the content that you wish existed or the content that you wish didn't exist anymore? You know what I mean? Any thoughts or opinions that you have on this subject? Let's start a conversation about it, my friend. But that's it for now, man. I'm going to get out of here. Thank you so much for your time, your attention, your subscription to Real English Radio. I, should, I really appreciate all the support. I really appreciate you giving your time and attention to me because you could have given it to anybody, but you're here with me. We rocking out, my friend. We rocking out. But I'm going to get out of here, man. Thank you for listening to Real English Radio. I'm your host, Tony Kaizen, and I'll talk to you soon. Peace.